Welcome. Uh, I appreciate everybody coming out for our fireside chat today. Uh, we have a very special guest, Greg Fowler. He is an alumni of San Diego State University. Uh, he is a founder and managing director at FPA Multifamily LLC. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for coming out today. Um, did you fly out uh, from San Francisco? Uh, Santa Barbara today. Santa Barbara, okay. And then I believe you're, you're headed to New Orleans right afterwards? Hopefully, if everything works, I should be in New Orleans tonight, yes. It's going to get a little more space. So um, just so everybody knows how this is going to go today, um, well, Greg, we invited you out today because uh, we want to get our students um, acquainted with other uh, alumni um, who have been successful um, and who they can en envision themselves as having similar type of success. So what we're looking for um, is a little bit about your background and your career. Um, and then some advice that you have to share uh, for them. Everybody's going to walk in different footsteps, but seeing how you did it and, and hearing your advice could really make a difference uh, for our students. And we appreciate you agreeing to uh, do this fireside chat with us. Okay. Uh, so the fireside chat is going to be broken up into three sections. One is going to be your background. Um, so uh, we'll skip the profile and then we'll jump into talking about you. Um, and then section two is going to be advice uh, from, from you to the students. And then we're going to open it up to Q&A um, to our, our students. So um, with that said, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and how you chose to came to SDSU, um, just so our students can see themselves a little bit in you. OK. Um, so I grew up uh, carpentry of Ventura mostly. Um, had a mom that kept switching husbands out, so I kept switching schools. And uh, my original goal was really, I had really good grades in high school. And at that time, San, you know, San Diego State's like Harvard to get into now. But when I was going here, it wasn't nearly as hard academically. And even the UCs weren't nearly as hard academically, although there wasn't the great inflation we have now. I have four kids. So uh, anyway, things have changed in a lot of ways. But um, this was really kind of my backup school. I was really planning on going to USC. Um, I didn't really know how tenuous my mom and her then husband's situation was, so I didn't apply for a lot of financial aid. I did win some scholarships. And it kind of came in last second. Um, I just didn't have the money. My mom got divorced again, and I always worked, and I had quite a bit of money saved. I was very entrepreneurial. But when I ran the numbers, it was gonna be really hard for me to go to SC, so I really came here at the last second, a friend of mine was a big football star, and through him, I was able to get in late. Um, and I came here, I'd never been to the campus. And so, um, it was like 115 degrees, I think, and I drove up my Volkswagen bus, and I was a surfer, and, and I thought, God, this is far away from the beach, and I went to basketball camp at Point Loma College, and I think I'd been to another camp at USD, um, and I thought, this, this is not that great. It's, it's hot. We're far from the beach. But uh, I moved into Omega Hall, and, uh, and uh, kind of the rest is history and had a really good time going here and learned a lot. And I think the biggest thing I learned going here was how to hustle from getting classes to um, picking a major to getting internships to financially just making it happen. Um, I think that really was a big part of my success is a lot of the failures and hustles. Yeah, so you're thinking uh, USC ended up uh, becoming an Aztec. Uh, what's the thing that st stands out to you the most about your, your time here on campus? Um, I just, well, I mean, really it's the, the look of how much has the schools evolved, you know, since I went here um, and just how much it's climbed nationally and, and, and the contrast, it was just a simpler time when I went here. It was, you know, school was super cheap back then and it's not, you know, retrospectively, it's not that expensive now compared to other schools. I know it's expensive. But it was a pretty simple time. Like most kids had worked, you know, growing up. Most kids worked during school. Um, and I think, I think the, the, the things I remember really are just figuring things out. I guess that's the biggest thing I remember is like going here with not a lot of life or job skills, knowing how to work and how to hustle, but just from getting a major and getting classes to get the heck out of here because I, I didn't have the money to stay in school. I wanted to work. Um, and, and just, you know, from relationships with friends, with, with, with administrators, with work, just kind of trying to keep all those balls in the air. Uh, I, think, I think that's the part I remember. And even 
And a lot of the hardest things at the time that I really re resented or was really bummed out about how those shaped me for today, that a lot of the failures led to where I'm at now. Speaking of uh, figuring things out, uh, that the major thing is one of the first things that our students really have to figure out when they get here, and you ended up majoring in finance. How did you uh, decide upon that? School came natural for me. It wasn't like I was a straight A student because I didn't have to try that hard, but finance I thought was something I could learn and use, and I was good with numbers. And there were a lot of, like as I said, it wasn't that hard to get in here then, so I had a lot of fraternity brothers that could barely fog a mirror that were looking for communications. I'm sorry if any of you are communications majors, or whatever was the easiest major just to get through. I actually thought if I was gonna go to school, I might as well learn something. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't like a big companies were hiring out of San Diego State at that time for finance. Like, you know, the accounting had pretty good hiring, the accounting major and I knew I didn't want to be an accountant. Um, it just, the numbers spoke to me. I, I kind of had in my head potentially real estate or some investing, but it wasn't like I came here knowing what I was gonna do or the company I was gonna build or you know, what all happened. It all kind of happened in small steps and I can't, you know, it was a long time ago. You know, I'm probably older than most of your parents. Um, so, you know, it was, it was just the major that spoke to me and I think it seemed like a serious major where I would, if I was gonna spend the time, like I said, learn something. All right, uh, how did you end up uh, getting your first uh, job? What was it? And um, how did you decide on a career in real estate? Okay, I always work. So my first job was selling seeds door to door okay. in the third grade. Um, <laughs> and then I pulled weeds and then I cleaned a church as a janitor and then I detailed cars, worked in restaurants. My grandparents were farmers in Oregon. My mom used to ship me off every summer and I'd live with my grandparents. So I, I picked fruit as a kid. Um, you know, when you're little, they have you pick things like peaches or apples because you don't have the dexterity. And then as you get older, things like strawberries. I moved irrigation pipes. You know, I worked in liquor stores. I worked in uh, stores, I mean, I, I, I did everything. And I think that's something that that is missing for kids now, because I think, there, believe me, there were a lot of failures in some of those things. I worked for a landscape company once and I wasn't digging the holes deep enough and the guy gave me, you know, gave it to me. And I was 14 or 15 now. And I think about if I talk to my kids and the tone that that kid talked to me today, I don't know if they could handle it, but I think those were good life lessons, how to work, how to fail maybe not get asked back the next summer to do a job if you didn't do a good job. Mm -hmm. um, so I, and dealing with adults and dealing with people trying to scam from you giving them change and them trying to tell you something that wasn't true. I think all those jobs taught me a, a lot that I used later. But at the time I was just surviving. I had to make my own money because my parents weren't giving it to me. They didn't have it. And so anyway, but the first job out of college was, so I went through all the job. How many of you guys are rising seniors or seniors? Okay, so you're finally focused on getting a job, good. Um, it's gonna be a tough year, just, and we'll talk about that later if, if the questions leave there. A, a tough vintage year. I, I came out in a really tough year, so they had all the, the people were out on the quad, and the one job I got offered out of here was for Sealy Posturepedic selling uh, mattresses in Spokane, Washington. And at the time, you know, Spokane's actually a nice town, and there's great fishing there, and, a lot of cool things about it, it's where Gonzaga is. But at the time, to me, Spokane, Washington sounded like hell on earth. So the first job I got out of here was straight commission selling home loans when rates were 14%. And um, I graduated on Saturday at six or seven at night, and I started work Monday morning at 6 a.m. in Kearney Mesa. And I did get a draw for six months, $1,000 a month. So that was my first job was at um, San Marino Savings, off like Convoy Court in Kearney Mesa. That was the best offer I had. Mm -hmm. And there were like seven of my friends that also had that job. It was a startup. There were also sitting state grads that were all good kids, but that was like the best opportunity. There just weren't a lot of great opportunities that vintage year coming out of here. I appreciate you sharing all of those other jobs that you had because um, those helped shape who you are and who you've become. Um, so, you know, if you're out there and, and let's say you're, you're serving tables right now, um, that is great experience for you to have. Um, ultimately, we want you to start focusing on career things while you're here at San Diego State University, but never discount the things that, that bring you uh, to where you are. And by the way, my first job was in landscaping, so uh, definitely understand what you were, <laughs> you were talking about. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy, 
Um, but um, I love to talk about it when, when I have the opportunity to. Um, so what brought you to real estate? Well, I really wanted to get in real estate right out of college. I bought a fourplex. I kind of fell into this deal. I had an inter internship, and um, it took about a year to close the deal. Um, and I had to bring my original partner in at the end because he had a paying job, and I was working in restaurants. Um, but I just was interested in real estate, but no one would hire me when I was... I was barely 22, out looking for a job. I looked 12. And um, it's funny because we live in San Francisco in a building. And I don't know, if, have, have any of you guys heard of the firm Marcus Millichap? It's a commercial real estate firm. So they hired anybody. They, they were like the kid like me that had no experience, no contacts, no real knowing. It was a desk and a phone, and you'd cold call owners and try to sell commercial buildings. And they wouldn't hire me. And now I live in this big co-op in San Francisco, we live in Santa Barbara as well, and um, George Marcus lives in my building, the head of Marcus Millichap, and he likes to joke how good their hiring was that I didn't get hired by their great hiring, and I was pretty successful in real estate. Um, but anyway, no one would hire me. So, I, uh, can I digress and tell a story? Absolutely, so, floor. Okay, so no one would hire me, so I was doing loans, the RTC came in and took over San Marino Savings, so I went, and made all these loans. We finally got some low interest rate money. And I got all these engineers, because to get a loan back then, you had to have sterling credit, you had to have a high wage, and you had to have a percentage of your income going for loans. So I figured out that all these engineers, because they had all this defense contracting in Kearney Mesa, I went and passed out flyers, and I had these guys that were making, back then, 70, 80 grand a year, which was a lot of money, lined up to get loans, because they had 16, 17, 18% loans, and I had 13% money. So I did all these loans, and it looked like I was gonna make 100 grand in 83. Well, the bank got taken over by the RTC. We did the loans, I never got paid. The government decided never to pay me, so I think I made 8,500 bucks in 83. So then I went to work for Beverly Hills Savings, which was owned by these brothers, and it was kind of the same thing. They were doing all this self-loan to each other. And by then I could see the writing was on the wall that this one was gonna get taken over as well. So I decided I wanted to get into commercial real estate. I was really going to focus. So at that time, C.B. Richard Ellis, then called Caldwell Banker Commercial, was owned by Sears. Sears Roebuck owned Caldwell Banker. They also owned Dean Witter. So I saw, and the, everything was in the newspaper then. There wasn't the internet. So I saw this ad um, for, to get to be a stockbroker for Dean Witter. And I knew that if you made it through these rounds, they were going to give you this personality test which I've been trying to get CB to hire me, coal banker, but the, the personality test was, I don't know, 800,000 bucks, and the guy wouldn't take my call. I called him like 300 times or something. That's the rumor. Maybe it was 200. I called him a lot. So I went through this cattle call. I went in one of these old hotels in Mission Valley. They had this huge conference room, and at the end, they had these tests, and I'm really good at math, and it was like, if a stock sells for $7 and you buy 10 shares, 70 bucks, and the commission's 10%, the commission's $7, right? Like, stuff like that. So I, I was the first one out of there. A thousand people in the room. I'm like, oh, I must have done something wrong. So they called me back. Only like 100 people passed these 10 questions or 15 questions. And the guy that was doing the interview was a stockbroker. He'd been an SAE. And when I was a freshman, um, he'd rush me and I had joined his fraternity, but I was always nice to him. And that one thing I'm going to tell, always be nice to people, even if they're in your arch rival fraternity, sorority, business thing, you fight over a girl or a guy or whatever. It's always good to be nice to people. So he liked me, he put me like a gold star. Then we had another interview, and we had another test, and I crushed the test. So finally I got the personality test. I take the test, I figure, okay, what would a fighter pilot, you know, pro quarterback say on this? And I answered all the questions. I had the highest score they'd ever had on this personality test. So Dean Witter calls up, there's four candidates, some guy that had sold at stocks for, or sold copiers, which was the great job out of San Diego State then, for Xerox, another guy that had sold you know, early stage computers for IBM, and another guy that was connected um, from a long line of families in La Jolla along the Beach and Tennis Club. And the guy said, look, you have the highest score. I see all this entrepreneurialism. I can see you're hungry. You look 21. Like, I don't know that you're going to be great at selling stocks. And I looked at the guy and said, yeah, I, I know I'm going to be good at selling stocks, but I don't want to sell stocks. I have the same personality test that C.B. Ruggiellis has. I just passed. I have the highest score. Will you call this Arlie Williams guy who I've called 300 times at C.B. and tell him about me? So he did. So anyway, they finally offered me a job uh, selling land in Carlsbad, which at that time was like, you know, being, I don't know, 
Paris, California or something. It wasn't, it was way out there. Carlsbad was far. San Diego was not connected. Um, and I told this tale at a Toastmasters class because I wanted to learn how to speak better. And this guy that was a commercial real estate guy um, of the small firm walked up to me and said, you don't want to sell land for CB in Carlsbad, come to work for me. So that was kind of my big break. And then he mentored me. And I think I made 25 grand in 84. And then I started doing leasing, leasing office buildings for these guys. And I know I made 102,000 in 85. And then 86, I think I made 250 grand. And then in 87, I made 500, which was like making 5 million now. That was a big thing. And then I was recruited to go to work for Isle of Thorne, which was a really prestigious firm. But I want you guys to know, it wasn't like this straight shot. Like, I mean, I worked for this bank. I got screwed on my commissions. I worked for this other bank. They went out of business. No one would hire me. It wasn't easy. Like, there was no easy. And the other thing I want to tell you, life isn't fair. Like, I mean, like, I feel like I should have gotten with a college graduate, and I had good grades. I got out in four years, or three and a half, really. I was working. No one got out in three and a half years back then. No one went right to work. And it, but I never felt sorry for myself. And part of it is I never had the chance to. I didn't have a backstop. I didn't have parents who would help me. I didn't have another opportunity. But I think all those early failures made me want to really be the best when I had the opportunity. So when I got to work at the commercial real estate firm, if there were coffee cups all over at the conference table, I'd pick them up. And back then, you were really dependent on your admin, your secretaries, the people that helped you, that typed the leases, things like that, because you didn't have all the automatic of internet, and you couldn't have the AI write your lease for you, which is what's about to happen. You had to type them out. But the fact that I was always the one to clean the kitchen or to bring lunch to this admin, they were always the one, if I needed a lease typed at Saturday, you know, Saturday or if I needed them to sell 8 o'clock at night, or if I had to bring their typewriter from the office to their home to get them to help me and pay them some extra money, they would always do it for me. And I never did this stuff thinking, this is going to help me out. It was my natural way. But I can just tell you, everything I've done for other people, stuff like this, has always helped me a hundredfold. One of you guys may work for a bank someday, and you're going to remember that I spent time with you, and there's going to be some great deal you took back, and you're going to remember I helped you, and that, that's just how the world kind of works. Anyway, sorry to go off on this <laughs> wild amazing. tangent. Yeah. Those are some amazing life lessons, Greg. Um, you know, so. Just because you get a major in, in real estate, it doesn't guarantee you that you're going to start your first career in real estate or, or whatever your degree is going to be. But hard work and perseverance is what's needed to get you to where you want to go. And I think it's a good opportunity for me to make a pitch for our Career Management Center at the Fowler College of Business because we can help you with that. We can prepare you uh, to roll up your sleeves outside of the classroom and do the things that you need to do uh, to walk your own path. You know, that was Greg's path. Um, and you're going to be able to walk your own path. So speaking about all the setbacks, you know, that you have, you know, and challenges in your career, you decided to become an entrepreneur and open up your own firm, FPA Multifamily LLC. Uh, there's a lot of risks that, that come with that, and you might have had some setbacks as well. How did you come to that decision that you're going to open up that firm? And what were the challenges in doing it? Well, you know, the firm really had started with the first building I bought when I was still in school, right? We bought a fourplex, but then, you know what I made, right, in 83, 8,500 bucks? You know what I made in 84, 80, 25 grand? I don't have any extra money. But in 86, you know, we had more money. So by late 85, I could see we were going to be able to buy more. So my original partner, I, who I'd met here, um, a guy named Martin Shore, who just won a Grammy, actually, for a movie called Take Me to the River, New Orleans. So watch the video. It's great. We're going to New Orleans tonight. But anyway, Martin was a couple years older than me and had a paying job. And um, we decided to keep buying properties. But no one was giving us money. It was all our own capital. Um, so we, we bought the first deal, and that worked out. And then I bought another uh, on uh, 3145 Ivy Street in what we call um, kind of the Golden Hill, South Park area. I bought another one. Then, I bought, then Martin and I bought 2108 Dale Street. And I bought another one on 3145 Ivy Street. Then I bought one in North Park on Dale Street, uh, Grimm Avenue. Then I bought 2165 Second Avenue. And I ran all these properties. So I was working as a commercial real estate broker, making all this money. And at night, after work at 7 or 8, I was painting um, buildings and um, working till you know, 8, 9, 10 at night, fixing up buildings and then weekends doing drywall. And I still remember the first time, because I wasn't that handy, 
Um, I was raised by women, and my wife's much more handy than me, so I'm not trying to upset women, but I was not taught how to do a lot with tools and stuff. And I remember when Martin and I bought the first building, he had this Plymouth Station Angle with a Grateful Dead sticker, and I remember driving away, and we bought all the stuff at the original Home Depot, and all those drywall and paint and stuff, and I'm thinking, like, I don't even know what I'm going to do with this stuff, because we had holes in the wall where the tents had kicked them out. And anyway, but I figured it out, and it was cool, but it was hard. And at the same time, I was going to graduate school at UCSD at night as well. So let's um, kind of shift gears for a moment and talk about the advice for our students. So they can hear a lot of your path and, and the difficulties that you had to overcome, but let's put ourselves back into the seat of being a student. So you're a student now at SDSU. What would you say to our other students? What should they be doing right now to help them to be successful in the future? Um, you know, my wife and I, and my wife's here, um, Elizabeth, um, I think the number one thing is you've got to get skills that are going to go into the workplace. So, you know, if you want to open a surf shop, obviously you want to work in other surf shops. You want to know everything about surfing. You know, you want to read everything you can, et cetera. But if you want to go in real estate, you know, you need to really learn how to use Argus if you're going to go in the office market, how to use Excel, and I'm talking about being super proficient, how to model. You've got to be able to know how to write and craft an email correctly because so much now comes with email. You know, you get from my age, probably not a good idea to text me the first time and not say your name, right? I get texts all the time from people, hey, I saw you speak. I'm like, and my question back is, who is this? Because I don't know, right? So I think, e you know, email is a critical thing in business. Um, you've got to learn how to do a package, meaning how to look at an investment, break it down, and write a synopsis and be confident and competent in doing it. But I think the biggest thing is you've got to have internships and you've got to build a network. You've got to have people that are going to mentor you. So if you were in a club and there's people older than you, take them to lunch. You know, ask people to lunch. You know, use your parents' friends. Use your parents. Use your uncle that was a successful uncle, even if your dad doesn't like him. You know, just try to you know try to get yourself to meet other people and try to talk to people that have been through the process. I think one thing I will say this way is a lot of the kids we were talking to in May of 22 were talking about how much money they won and it was irrational and there's going to be way, way less jobs this vintage year, this, this year because companies are laying off and that's tied to the Fed tightening and interest rates going up. So banks are failing. A lot of banks that were hiring classes are not going to hire people this year. You know, we're not hiring any experienced interns this year. We're bringing people into the property level at department buildings. Um, but we're not hiring any pe new people in our San Francisco office. So it, it just, it, it, I think you want to get out there and network and you want to have good skills. And when you have an opportunity, you want to look right, play the part, et cetera. I, um, I'm involved with the USD real estate school. I'm on the real estate board there. And we interviewed this young woman a year and a half ago. And, you know, she came on the call and she had a hoodie on and she looked, like uh, the Unabomber, you guys are all too young to remember who the Unabomber was, but it just was super inappropriate. And USD's got a really good program, and she was a good student, but she just did not wow my guys that I turned her on to doing an interview. Another kid, first generation kid, I was really trying to help, that I played rugby with a bunch of fr friends of mine, my kids' friends at Santa Clara. He's interviewing us, he's in a t shirt, sweaty, and his friend walks, his brother, his roommate walks by in his boxers in the middle of a call. Just not a professional situation. So you don't you only have these few chances where someone's going to help you and it's like an egg and you got to hold that softly because there aren't you know no offense but you guys didn't go to Harvard, right? And and if you're an accounting major and you're top of your class here, you're going to get a lot of job offers, but 95% of the people are not at top of their class and you're going to have to hustle for that first job. So when people want to help you, you have to respect their time and and, and follow up and take it seriously. And you know, a handwritten thank you note if someone spent time with you is a critical thing. You know, knowing what people want is a critical thing. If he helps you at the job center, you know, bringing him, a uh, asking him if you want a coffee or texting him, you know, that means something. If she helps you at the career center and you know, and, and gets you an internship, bringing her some flowers and a thank you card. That's how the world works. The more you give, the more you get. And I will say, this, no one owes you anything. And after you get this degree. After your first job, no one even really cares, unless you're at Stanford or Harvard, and believe me, all they, they talk about it all the time. 
no one cares where you went to school. It's how you did at that job. Did you add value to the team? Are you smart? Can you get things done? Are you not a rubble rouser? Do you cause problems? Like, you know, because it's not a union. We get like employees that get like Marxists and they want to make everything fair. Or they want to negotiate in a group. And we really just want people that want to add value and that have a good attitude and that want to move ahead and that are appreciative of the opportunities we give them. And people don't want to deal with a lot of attitude. So I, I guess we're jumping probably of what, you know, what the advice I give is, you know, make yourself valuable and have a great attitude are I think the most important things. All right, uh, you mentioned um, getting a mentor as a piece of advice. Um, is there a mentor that stands out in your life uh, that helped shape your career? How did you meet that person and, and what did they do to help you? Yeah, there's never anyone that really took me under their wing. I was a pretty street smart kid, so I worked for this guy that was a big real estate guy in, in, this, in the Ventura area, Bud Smith. Um, and I was lucky enough to spend some time with him, mostly driving around his various girlfriends when his wife would show up to the properties. He really trusted me to do that because he knew my stepfather. Um, so it was kind of a different time. But he would, you know, if I called him with a question, he would answer it. And then when I started in commercial real estate and had some success, people that were owned the buildings would want to invest in me because they thought I could make them money. So I think the biggest thing with a mentor is giving something back. So you guys are young. If you understand social media and you can look at someone's website and give them constructive criticism or a way to help them, that would be a good thing. If you understand AI, because AI is just coming out, if you've already figured out AI, like meet with someone like me and say, hey, Greg, you know, I've thought about it. Here's some ways AI can help you, and here's what I already know about AI, and here's ways you could, you know, use it at the property level. Then you're valuable. I don't think many people are just going to mentor you forever. I mean, I'll, you know, you come to Santa Barbara, I want to grab a cup of coffee. If I like it, I'll usually meet with you or spend a little bit of time with you. But you're going to have to stand out and you're going to have to add something back of value. So a lot of you got to figure out what am I good at? How do I add value? You know, am I someone that gets a lot of work done? Am I someone with great ideas? You know, in real estate, there's really three things that matter. Can you execute? Can you, can I write down a piece of paper, you know, like this, and that these are all things, hey, can you get this done here? Can you check all those things and get them done? You know, basically 99% right. And, and not complain about it? Can you find deals? Can you find opportunities for the company or me to make money? Can you find equity? Can you find money that will go in deals? Um, it's really, can you get something done? Can you add value you know, to the deals? Can you find the deals or can you find the money? Uh, everything besides that is just a job like, and it's pretty replaceable. So when you're thinking about, like, especially in business, you know, what do I add? It, it, you've got to have a shtick. And for me, I could get a lot of stuff done and I could lease a lot of space and I could get people to make quick decisions and get that lease signed that day. And I always had that burning desire. Um, another book I read, uh, um, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Like, and it doesn't really tell you what it is, but it gives you the feeling of you got to have the sense of getting things done. And you got to sometimes put out things that matter a lot to you. I love to surf. I've got a place at Hall's Ranch. I barely surfed in my 20s because I worked. And I was so committed to getting ahead. And those first two years were so difficult that when I started succeeding, I was so scared for it to stop that I think you almost have to go into it with a sense of fear and a sense that, that it really matters. Because your 20s, they, they really set you up. Because if, you know, if you're like me and you get married and you have kids, as you get older and you have more going on, you have less time. So I feel like it was that time when I didn't have a family, I didn't have a relationship that I needed to commit time to, enabled me to give 300% to my career. And I think that really enabled me to, to do it because I didn't have other things conflicting with it. Yeah, so circling back to the, the networking, uh, and you're talking about adding value. Um, so. You know, networking is one of the things that if you come to see me, I'm going to tell you first that you need to start doing uh, for your uh, career. So, uh, but the adding value part, I want to supplement that by saying that with networking, it can be so easy to add value because you don't necessarily have to know the um, thing that someone needs help with. So if Greg needs help 
um, let's say with some type of topic, you know professors here at SDSU. You said, hey, Greg, would you like me to introduce you uh, to Kamal, uh, Dr. Haddad in, in the back, right? And uh, so you can make that introduction uh, for Greg. Um, so that's one way that you can uh, add value. Uh, Greg, if you were going to hire a student, so you said right now you're not hiring interns, but eventually you will. Um, so if you're hiring hire a bunch of interns, we're just not hiring a bunch of full-time people this year. As analysts, we're, we're hiring people at the property level, which is a lot of people think is a lesser start, but it's a start in the industry. Yeah. All right, so, so what is it that you're looking for when you're sitting down with the student and they're interviewing with you? What pops out, what stands out, what's gonna get them hired? I think, you know, people that wanna learn, people that um, are earnest, people that don't um, have a sense of entitlement, um, people that are hardworking, um, you know, probably not good to talk about vacation policy day one. Um, uh, you know, people that want to come in and make a difference and they want to add value. And, and, and I think people are smart enough to realize, I want to work so hard and add so much value, I'm going to become invaluable to this organization. And realize that, you, look, there's, there's people who will take advantage of you. You may go to a company and add a lot of value and they never appreciate it. At that time, two, three years in, you may need to move on. But usually, if you're valuable, you're going to move up. But you got to be valuable first. So, you know, people don't want to talk about your feelings or, or what your career path is in month one or two. You need to get in there. You know, my oldest son is starting work, and he's getting married, um, you know, in a year. And I said, you don't even want to talk about a vacation because you're going to need time off on your wedding in a year. Right now, I wouldn't take a, a vacation day or think about a vacation until your wedding next April. Like, you have to have that mindset. And I think you know, he kind of looked at me, and he's had a pretty charmed life, and he's worked plenty, because we've always pushed it, my wife and I. Um, but I still think it's kind of shocking, but it, it's real life. And once you're out of school, people generally don't want to babysit you. Um, they want you to come in and act adult-like and add value. So what I'm looking for is people that have worked, people that have shown that have great references, um, people that know how to act, know how to dress, that I know they're going to be able to sit in the office and sit in that cube and be able to do the work product. People I'm going to be proud to put out that can meet my investors, my other employees, um, our customers. We rent apartments. We own 46,000 apartment units. So we have 100,000 residents. So when I'm looking at you, I'm looking at, do you carry yourself to represent me? And, and the same thing, when you look for your boss, do I like the people and the company I'm working for? And I guess the other advice I give you is, you know, so many people in the first job worry about first year comp. And I could have taken the 18 grand and moved to Spokane and sold beds, and I said made 8,500 bucks, but that was the best decision I ever made. So when you're looking for that first opportunity or any opportunity, do you respect the people you're you know, working for? Are they successful? Are they well respected? Is the company well capitalized? If you look at them online, is there a lot of crappy stuff about them on the internet? Are they in lawsuits all the time? Do they have a lot of turnover? But at the same time, when I'm looking at you, are you a job hopper? Are you going to leave me for 10 grand? We had a kid last year from SMU that we hired that interned for us in two summers, and he left for what he thought was maybe 25 grand more, but with commissions, he could earn more working for us, but he wanted to be able to tell his parents and his friends he's made 100 grand, and that job sense has been eliminated. So he was the last guy in, he was the first guy out. So I, I would say we're looking for people when you first work for us, we're adding most of the value. We're training you, we're paying you. That, that, you've got to add something back. And um, so that, that, that means a, a commitment of your time too. And I think you know, if, it's not, if it's not gonna work with you, I think the sooner you tell an employer, hey, I don't think it's a fit, really the better than saying something you're miserable with. But at the same time, you don't want to be 32 and have had five or six jobs. Because when I, look, when I get resumes, and there's you know, someone 50 that's had 15 jobs at college, I'm not going to interview them. It's just too much. I'm looking for people that are going to stay because it's hard to add value. And like in real estate, we share the profits of the company with the, with the people, but it takes when you buy a deal, seven years to sell a deal typically, three to seven years. You're not going to make any money with us if you're not committed long term. I mean, big money. So it, it, you got to really buy into who you're working with. And anyway. Yeah, so on, on that note, uh, for those students that are considering a career in real estate, 
uh, why should should they go into real estate and um, what what should they look out for? What is what is your advice for their students that are going to enter real estate? I think if you're a hard worker and a self starter, you know, look, there's not like I, I grew up in track houses in Ventura, right? And and you know, went to Zane State, which was my first choice when it was easier to get in here because of money. And you know, I run a multi-billion dollar company and you know, it's a great thing, it's fun, it's America, right? So th that's the upside of real estate. But if you're not self-motivated or you can't choose to work when there's a perfect west swell and the wind's are right and you are afraid of commission, it's a tough business because in real estate, it's usually kind of an eat what you kill business. So if you're entrepreneurial, if you're the kind of kid that went and sold encyclopedias door to door, or, you know, you sold all the, you know, the, the swag to fraternities and sororities and you know how to make things happen or you lived on commission and it's probably, and you want to work hard, it's a really good industry. And there's a lot of ways to get into it. And there's more stable ways. You can go in property management. That's more of a paycheck type business. You can be an appraiser. You can sell title insurance, which is a salary and base. But if you're gonna go be like a broker, which is where the most upside is, or be an owner, which is where there's even more upside, you're gonna personally guarantee loans, which means if you don't pay the mortgage back, and plenty of people are not going to in the next three years, there's gonna be a lot coming on, bad stuff in real estate. With the rates suddenly going up, they can take your home, they can take your money in the bank. So if you're not a risk taker, and everyone's not, it's a tough business. I like it because you get to solve problems. You know, now we raise money from the sovereign wealth funds, all the top 50 endowments, all the top 50 colleges and universities. I'm dealing with some of the smartest people in the country. And, it, and I'm competitive. We compete against other people for the same money. There's probably 12 or 13 groups that can raise a fund. Our new fund was a billion, $455 million. And with leverage, we can buy four and a half million dollars in apartments. So call it a 200,000 unit, 25,000 apartment units. And people gave me that money discretionarily, meaning they committed to give me the money. So when I write, when we send out an email and say, you need to fund this money, they committed to do that. So they're counting on me to earn them outsized returns. And it's very competitive to get that money. Um, so it's a great thing if, if, you know, to, to do. And there's a lot of upside with real estate, but it's not, it's not like a banking job where you can go golf and go coach your kids at three every, you know, every Thursday. It's, it's, it can be a, an all-encompassing, you gotta give everything to it. So you gotta kind of figure out what you want from your career. A lot of you guys are gonna wanna, look, I didn't get a job when I was out of college because I told the guy, he asked me what I wanted to do when I was 30 and I told the guy, well, if I can make 100 grand, which seemed like a lot of money back in the 80s, and drive a BMW and live in Scripps Ranch, um, which was kind of the new track of the day. But when I was 30, that would be my idea of success. And the guy didn't hire me. Um, and I met the guy later, and he goes, why didn't I hire you? I'm like, because I didn't want enough. Um, so you gotta figure out what you want in your life. But I think the thing about real estate is there's unlimited upside. And for me, it's an entrepreneurial pers person. That's the great thing about it. And you know, the fact that by that time I was 24 or 25, I was highly successful and highly regarded. And by the time I was 30, you know, people were giving me money to buy real estate out of my market. And by the time I was 40, you know, I was you know, one of the top people in the industry. That, that's the cool thing about it, unlimited upside. But there's also unlimited downside. All right, um, I got one more question and then I'm gonna open it up to uh, Q&A because I wanna hear from um, our students. Um, so we've talked a lot about your struggles and, and how hard it was to finally get to where you are now. Uh, but now that you've had a successful career by, by most accounts, how is it that you would like people to talk about Greg Fowler? What is it that you want them to see about you as a professional? Because I think that's really going to help the students visualize where they want to go. It's one thing to say, I want to be a founder of a real estate agency. It's another thing to say, this is what I want people to remember my career as. Yeah, I think for me, you know, we have a really good track record in the business, which is track record in real estate is your multiple, so how many times you made them on their money, and the internal rate of return. Um, I think most of you probably have the concept of what an internal rate of return is. So that track record is super important. We've realized 550 deals, so we've bought and sold 550 buildings. 
um, which I think is up there, you know, in terms of companies that have done that. So I want to keep that track record good. Um, I, I think we've always been kind of a handshake shot, meaning if I tell you we have a deal, we have a deal. Um, we're not, we try to really do what we say we're going to do. Beyond that, I don't really care what other people think about me. I'm much more concerned about what my wife and my kids and my close friends think about me. I don't really do it for other reasons. I mean, I, I really try to help, in particular, first-gen kids, and really it's just kids that don't, don't have a parent that can help them or a school that can help them get that first level. So my thing is, if everything was fair, if every kid had the same opportunities, I think most kids out of state could do just as well as most kids out of Stanford or Harvard. And I think a lot of it's just opening up those doors. So I like to help with that. But at the same time, I, I really don't like to do anything charitable that's um, high profile because I, I think if you're doing charity work, it should be out of your heart. And my wife, on their hand, runs our foundation and does a lot of charity things and volunteers a lot. And she gets a lot of accolades run. And she thinks it's important because it gets other people, motivates other people to do it. I just don't want to be that person. And I'm also not looking for more people to call me every day. Um, I get as many emails and calls as I want. So I, I just, I don't, I'm really trying to limit it. But I guess really just that I was fair, that um, I was really good at what I did and that, you know, that I gave back. But as I said, the relationship with my kids is probably the most, more important than what any of you think of me. I think that's really great. I mean, I feel like I've kind of come to a same place and that I just had my third uh, kid. I have a, a one month old newborn at, at home. Um, and I really think of myself as that dad uh, first, you know, and so uh, there's going to come a point in your professional career where, where climbing the ladder might not mean quite as much. I don't know, it, it could. Um, but, you know, I really appreciate that, that you've opened up and, and been real with our, our students and, and let them know a little bit about who you actually are as a person. Um, so with that said, um, I want to open it up to the students. Um, feel free to raise your hand if you have a question for Greg. What do you believe makes you the leader that you are now? And what advice do you think you could give to think like a leader? Yeah, I don't think, like, I'm any great leader. I'm pretty impatient, and I don't, like, I mean, I think I'm about, like, Patton, you know, like, in that I want to move, you know, from point A to point B. And I don't always worry about people's feelings. Um, I think what's made me successful, like my CIO's with me 20 years, my lawyer, in house lawyer's with me 30 years, I mean, my head of management's with me 30 years. I, I think I've always treated people fairly. Um, I don't have a lot of bureaucracy. I've always paid my people really well, but only the people that have added value. And I think I've been a quick decision maker. And when someone culturally is not a fit, I've made quick decisions. Um, to change them. And I've always been pretty honest with people. Um, I think as a leader, I wish I'd been, I, I really don't like conflict that much, so I really don't like to, I think if I could work on my adult self, I'd like to work on resolving things, you know, sitting down across the table and resolving things versus dictating things. Um, so I think that's something people need to learn, especially in today's world, because it's, you know, it's not as soft, it's a lot more soft and fuzzy when I was young, which is, you know, hey, here's a desk and a phone. Hopefully you make it. But I, I, I think the key is it just being true to yourself, treating other people the way you want to, you know, uh, be treated, and um, being honest. And, and I think hard work. I think, the, what, I think the reason that I've had success is people have seen me work hard and succeed, and the people that have worked hard for me and also been smart, because just working hard if you're dumb doesn't really help me or help you that much sometimes. Um, I, think, I think people seeing someone that came from nothing succeeding and then willing to share the wealth I think has been good and the people that have worked hard have been rewarded. So I, I guess that's really you know, rewarding the winners and, and, and trying to call the losers and trying to be fair with people. Thanks for the question. I think I saw one over here. And I'm going to stand next to you just because I got a mic okay. for our recording. Hello. Um, you mentioned that you got your first property while you were still here at SDSU. I'm just wondering how you navigated that, how you chose your property, and what made you choose to do that while you were still young. Yeah, it was complete luck. I had an internship. The woman that sat out front, you know, rates were really high. The woman that sat out, I worked for another internship called Private Ledger Financial Services. So I learned how to 
kind of look at a deal, and the deals back then were tax-driven, meaning they were driven to lose money on paper, which I never understood, because I was always kind of an income-oriented thing, but the tax laws um, were driven, so I, I really wanted a deal that cash flowed. So this woman had this fourplex, it was in South Park, she had a bunch of really crappy tenants in there, she wanted to move to Scripps Ranch, in my dream destination when I was 22, because um, she wanted a good school for kids, she didn't hear this building, and she just kept complaining she couldn't sell it. And so I'd already gotten my real estate license, and her listing expired, so I talked to her to give me a commission, which I could use as part of my down payment, and then I realized I was gonna need um, a carry, and she had it free and clear, so she was able to carry back part of the paper, and then I got my original partner, Martin Shore, involved, and we were able to structure the deal together. But it wasn't like I was looking to it, I was sitting out front, she was behind the desk here, and I was here waiting to be brought in to work my internship, because the company was paranoid that me as a 21-year-old was going to straight, trade, take all their trade secrets. I was super paranoid that on the company, so I didn't want anyone, the interns back in the office space without being um, watched. It was, it was a kind of eccentric company. But anyway, it just kind of fell into it by asking questions, by being talkative, and being smart enough to think, oh, maybe there's a deal here. This lady seemed pretty desperate to move this. But it happened over probably a six month period, getting her degree to sell it to me, and then took like another year to close it. I mean, the poor lady, I think her hair went from black to gray waiting for us to close it, because we barely got the loan closed. Um, but just figuring out and talking to people and asking questions, and a lot of it was luck. I mean, I attribute a lot of my luck, my success to luck, you know? So a lot of us being in the right place at the right time in the right industry. I mean, there, there's definitely luck involved in, you know, in, in success. These are some great questions. Thanks for that. Um, who else has a question? I see one over here. There you go. Hello. Hello. Um, so why did you decide to go the LLC route instead of starting a corporation off the bat? And then uh, what were some major challenges you faced when starting that LLC? Yeah, an LLC is just a legal entity to hold an asset. And tax-wise, it's way better because you pass through the losses and everything to the owner. So an LLC really is just, it's like a corporation, but much better for holding a single asset. And it's uh, it just, it, it's a lot better um, with corp. If you take something at a corporation, you've got to pay taxes at the corporate level. And then you've got to pay taxes again if you pay salaries. So it's double taxation. So a corporation for real estate isn't effective. That's why you'll see most, almost all real estate's held in LLCs or REITs because of the tax setup. So a corporation, an LLC is really the same protection as a corporation with the ability to pass through the income and expenses more efficiently. And really, I mean, the, the LLC is just, really, that's just a, a name, really. It's just, believe me, there's been deals that I bought early on that didn't, you know, San Diego had really tough times in the late 80s, 90s. There were deals that had negative cash flow, but I was making so much money leasing and selling office towers, my commissions, my day job, that I was able to feed those deals. But if I, had I not been able to, I would have lost deals and had to give them back and not had a good track record. Um, so, I mean, there, you know, in 09, I had a lot of personal guarantees. I, I would moved. Um, I wasn't, I didn't raise the institutional money, be, and I could have because I didn't see great opportunities in 07, 08. The market was really overinflated and um, you know, had really difficult times. There's been, a, believe me, there's a lot of difficult times. And we had a hurricane hit a building, you know, in the last week. We had another building uh, have a fire. I mean, it, and someone died. I mean, there's a lot. You know, you know, everyone wants to be king, right? That's why guys all joke until there's a problem, until there's a loan that's difficult, or there's a situation that's difficult, or there's a conversation that's difficult. I mean, uh, the LLC is really just a legal entity, and we own each deal in LLC, and then FPA is like a whole company. But really, my whole business was a series of one-off deals. Originally, my partner and I's money. Then we syndicated deals, which means we went to people that we knew that had money that put in 50, 100 grand whatever, back then, and we started buying um, apartments that way, and then we started doing one-off deals with larger groups, and now we, for the last 20 years, have done discretionary funds. And the nice thing about discretionary funds is that the money's there, if we find a deal, we know the equity's there, and we can do super quick closes. But each one's got its own sense of, uh, there's good and bad with each way to do it. All right, uh, thanks for that question. Um, great did point I, to have. I'm sorry, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. No. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, no, I'm trying to spew off too much coffee today.
<laughs> um, Greg is going to have to uh, catch a flight, but I'm going to allow for one more question. Please keep it to one. Uh, so I see one in the back here. I'm happy to stay for a few minutes afterwards if you want to come up and ask something personally. Hi, how's it going? Um, so I'm a Fowler alum, um, a few years from school. For um, I just really resonated with kind of the beginning of your journey. I've tried a wide variety of roles. I've worked in a ton of different industries, multiple different times thought, you know, I know exactly what I want to do, and it's just kind of, you know, it's kind of blown up in my face. So I guess my question is something you know, I think I struggle with, and I feel like I can. This is our speak last question, but Greg's going to stick around for a few minutes. Years, younger, older Thank than me. Um, you know, I guess, I guess, the first part of the question is, you know, how, on a personal level, you know, you know, how do you not, you know, become critical of yourself to the point where it's detrimental, or, you know, I feel like a lot of us in your very long lens focus. You can focus as much as you want on like security doing what you need to do right now to get by, but you know, in the back of your head, you're always thinking, what's next? How can I position myself? Everything along those lines. So I guess the best way to ask my question would just be, you know, how, how, what have you found to be successful as far as kind of staying the course, staying patient, knowing what you're doing, you know, is correct? Um, and just how, how do you navigate kind of the, the personal pitfalls of if you try something and you say it doesn't work out? Um, you know, how do you, how do you keep that spirit up? Um, you know, what have you found to be successful? If, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, you're almost making me cry because I remember how many freaking bad things happened, you know, those first couple of years out of school. I've only had one, two, three, four jobs in my life, and three of them were in the first year, right, because the companies went out of business and owed me money. Um, I just think you got to get back up, and you just got to know that you're, you, you look like a good person to me. I'm sure your parents probably tell you're a good person. My mom didn't really even tell me I was a great person. I didn't have that. I had a great grandmother, but didn't have that great parental thing. I'm an only child. Um, you just, I, all I can tell you is you just got to get up and you got to make the calls and you got to call the guy from CB Richard Ellis 300 times if that's what you want to be, uh, even though, and then when you, a better opportunity comes up, right? Like my dream job was to get to buy C, CB Richard Ellis, but a guy came and talked to me like something like this. He walked up to me and I realized that was a better opportunity and the guy was a complete jerk. You know, guy, he died a few years ago. I became so close with him, but he was an ex-Marine drill sergeant in Vietnam. He's just so tough on me, but I learned so much. And I guess the biggest thing is just, you got to write down, and you guys, none of you guys, my kids, you guys all write things on your phone. You know, I'd say get a legal pad and a pen, write down what you need to do that day, and don't go serve for, you know, ride bikes or roller skate or, you know, my, the thing I'm not real positive on is weed, you know, smoke weed. Like, you know, just get your shit done and not quit and pay yourself first. I mean, do what you need to do and make getting ahead your goal. And I, I can just tell you, everyone that has that attitude has done well. And, you know, I, we were doing this March Madness thing with a bunch of friends of mine, fraternity brothers, and these guys were way cooler than me in college. But a lot of these guys, their peak year was their senior year of college. And then they went to the easy job and their parents had connections and they went and did different in the world. Anyone, look, can do anything here. You know, Elon Musk was an immigrant. You know, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, like these guys, like, there is so much opportunity here. You just got to get up and keep fighting. And that's, that's all I can tell you. And it, it sucks. But you got to make enough money to live, right? And then you got to figure out what works for you and what resonates for you. And it's, you know, join a Toastmaster school. If you think graduate school will help you. I mean, I went to graduate school because I was suffering in this loan business and thought, well, maybe if I get more degrees, I can get a better job because no one was hiring people out of City State then. The school wasn't nearly as regarded as well as it is now. And I, but I met so many people that, because that was taught, it was the extended studies then, it wasn't the Rady School. I was the first graduate of the, what's now the MBA program. It was through the professional studies. But I met 10 people there that became like lifelong mentors, my, my real estate attorney, my syndication attorney, a land use guy, you know, I learned so much. So I just say, don't dick around and keep learning and something will fall through. But if you're, you know, if you're working in a bar, hanging around other college kids, the chances of something great are gonna come there. So if you have to work in a bar, I'd say, 
go try to work at La Jolla Beach and Tennis Club and be friendly and try to see if a guy says, hey, I could use you or you should meet my daughter or my son's thinking about doing this. or like You might get lucky, but you got to put yourself in situations to succeed. Yeah. And, and I also say be open to leaving San Diego, especially in real estate. There's only so many opportunities here. And you know, we've made offers to people that would, to go to our central office and they said no. And now they call back two years later and say, hey, is that offer still open? It's like, well, no, you turned us down then. But I, I, the best opportunity right now might be in San Antonio, Texas, or in New York, or in DC. I, I wouldn't let one to be in San Diego, or the surf, or the weather, or your hobby, you know, whether that's kite surfing or hang gliding or a college girlfriend or boyfriend, you know, keep you from your dreams. I, I would take the opportunity. And the biggest thing right now is just get experience and get in the game, even if it's not the opportunity you want. This is a really bad vintage year. Last year was the craziest ever. I mean, I had people from mediocre schools wanting crazy amounts of money and we were thinking about it. This year it's completely reversed. But I just hired a woman from USD, her, and I told the story, so someone has to hear the story twice, but C.B. Richard Ellis, the best guy for them is in Seattle on the West Coast, John Halgrimson. He's like real estate royalty, he lives in Seattle, he went to University of Washington, he makes millions of dollars a year selling apartments. His daughter, Mia, um, I don't think she'd mind telling the story, she went to USD, she had an honor roll, she's in a sorority, she had all the offices. And so she was in a sorority, social, and had all the GPA. She graduated in 20, COVID year, she didn't get offered a job. There are no jobs. And USD is a really good real estate program. We like to hire out of there. So she started as an on-site property manager for an apartment building, which, you know, she didn't, she had a, call, a degree and great grades. And then she you know, got that into being an analyst for CB Richard Ellis. Her dad helped her with that. And then we just hired her, you know, at, at six figures to come in our San Francisco office, and we're really excited about her. But she didn't do the straight line, and we see a lot of potential in her. But she didn't feel sorry for herself. She grew up affluent, she, you know, her dad was in the business. It didn't go the way she wanted, but she didn't quit. So the biggest thing is don't quit. Keep going, keep networking, go to Toastmasters, like, and ask people for help, and think about everyone you know, and if you're in a, fraternity or you played a sport and you know someone's I, I can't tell you how many of my kids friends I've helped with internships jobs you know kids you know, some of the kids I don't even like you know kids that were kind of I helped the kid that went to USD that kind of bullied my kid in the fifth grade but I still helped him so it's you know don't be afraid to ask and and, and but you know be thankful when people help you and and also ask people like what what would you think you know, honestly today, what could I have done better? Like if you called, met with me and said, hey, I met with you at lunch, what would you have done better? I'd say, well, you probably should have dressed this way or you should have had a resume ready or, you know, I'll tell you what I think. Um, but it, th there is still so much opportunity, but this is a tough year and you guys are all, I, just get working and figure out what you want to do. All right, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. And Craig, I want to thank you very much. Uh, I know you're not a spotlight person, uh, so this puts you a little bit out of your element, and you probably didn't know what you're going to get into when I said I want you to come and, and speak about yourself. But I, I think your story really made a big difference. And this might be a bit of a risk, but I'm going to do a live survey here. Raise your hand if Craig's story has added value to your own career search. So this is, this is why we asked you out here, Craig, and, and we really appreciate it. And to our students, I appreciate you coming and being proactive and doing this because this, listening to people like Craig, um, is going to help. Um, and you can come and meet with myself and with Tina and Michelle in, in the back. We have our student assistant, Naeli, too. We can all help you take what you hear from Greg and put that into action. So thanks again, Greg. We appreciate sure. it very much. And Elizabeth, thank you as well for, for being here. And if anybody wants to say hi or ask a question right now, and we are definitely looking to hire people in the property management space this year. Um, so if that's of interest to you, um, I'll give you my card. You can email me, and I'll put you in touch with the people. Um, but yeah, I, this is going to be a tougher year, so I'd say get out there and get on it right now. Mm -hmm.